of a pomegranate within thy locks. Thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Thy two breasts are like two ro young roes that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Until the great day break and the shadow flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love, there is no spot in thee. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shanir and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the lepers. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse! How much better is thy love than wine, and the smell of thine ointments than all spices! Thy lips, O oh my spouse, drop as the, the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed, my plants are an orchard of pomegranates, with pleasant fruits, camphor with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the cheap spices. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, Blow upon my garden that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. Here ends the second reading. series talking about the two trees in the midst of the garden, you probably thought, oh, that makes sense, good sense, right? Those are, those are prominent, important trees in, in the life of God's people. And then I went on to talk about the palm and the olive, and the, those kind of make sense. They're commonly described in the Bible, the palm for Palm Sunday, the olive as well. We have them on our trays, don't we? We eat olives here. The fig, now let's start to get a little strange, okay? <laughs> It's a little bit weirder to us. Maybe you have some holiday recipes, though, that have figs in them. And now, the pomegranate. The pomegranate. I'm guessing that none of you are regular consumers of pomegranates. It's kind of a strange fruit. It's not something that grows in this part of the world. It's not in our favorite recipes or holiday recipes. And if it's any consolation to you, the pomegranate was also something odd and unusual to the people of Israel. It doesn't grow naturally in Israel. They imported it, actually, from the area of Iran and northern India. That's the native home of pomegranate trees. And they were brought over closer to the Mediterranean area, area during the Bronze Age, some thousands of years ago, and became established and became a crop there. They were, they, they were a crop in the land of Israel when the people of Israel came and conquered it and settled there. A pomegranate tree will grow to be about 15 to 30 feet high. There are few species of the tree, just, just a couple. And their branches are very thorny, covered with thorns. And the fruit that they're bearing is not like an apple or a pear or something like that. It's more like a berry. If you open one up and you look at it, it's a lot like a large blackberry with the individual 
pieces wrapped around seeds cluster. A cluster of fruit that is exotic to us and was exotic to the ancient people of Israel. And despite the fact that it was a latecomer to Israel and that it was exotic, it gained importance in the faith of God's people and as a symbol among them. And the first time it's mentioned is the first reading that I had for you this morning, that passage from Exodus chapter 28, that whole section of Exodus is all about the Lord telling Moses how to build the tabernacle, how to build the place of worship and all the articles of worship that were in there. And the part I read was about something called the ephod, which was like a, a long vest worn by the high priest. And as it said there in the reading, at the bottom of that ephod, there were pomegranates. Think of them as like little pom-poms that, that were uh, stitched together with different colors, dangling off the bottom, the hem of that ephod. And between those little pomegranates, there were bells. And, and the tradition tells us that those bells were shaped like the flower of a pomegranate. And the pomegranates, those uh, cloth pomegranates ha hanging between the bells, kept the bells from whacking together so that they made an unusual sound. They made just a, a nice, beautiful, tinkling sound of those little bells of the bottom of the high priest's robe. And they would ring as he would move. He had that music of those little bells everywhere he walked. And as, the, as Moses points out, it's especially important that he has these on when he enters into the holy place, the place of sacrifice within the heart of the temple. He needed to have the sound of those bells with him. It's interesting, isn't it, Susie, that they're going in there with music, the sound of those bells as they walk into the holiest place in that sanctuary of the people of God. It illustrates for us, I think, the beauty and importance of music in our worship. Those pomegranates represented the fruit of the land, but they were not like, like an olive or a date. They weren't the popular fruits. These were the most expensive fruits that you could possibly get. They were special. And they, they were listed among the fruits to show that whole variety that was available to God's people there in that land of Israel, the completeness of God's provision to the people. In 1 Samuel, we have another mention of the pomegranate, and here it's not about the fruit, it's about the tree and the person sitting under the tree, and it's the first king of Israel, King Saul. He's been out fighting the Philistines with his army, and he's taking his rest under the shade of the pomegranate tree. And this is very appropriate for this first king of Israel, because in the minds of the people in that part of the world, the pomegranate was a symbol of royalty. A symbol of royalty. And that's probably for a couple different reasons. The first is one I just mentioned, and that's that it's not cheap, right? <laughs> the average guy could not afford pomegranates. So it's the food of royalty. And the second is the unusual shape and development of the fruit. What happens is there's, there's a flower on the end of the, where the fruit is growing, and that flower will fall off, and just below where that flower was, there's a part of the, of the uh, flower called the calyx. It's, uh, it's little green leaves. And when that flower falls away, they're shaped, the, that calyx, those little leaves are shaped like a crown. They're shaped just like a crown. And to the minds of the Israelites, that symbolized that royalty. It's a royal fruit for the people. And so for the first 
king of Israel to be sitting under that pomegranate tree was very fitting. And it, he's, he's there uh, probably enjoying the fruit of those pomegranates, a symbol of his reign and rule. For Christians in a later era, if you see a painting of Jesus holding a pomegranate, it's a symbol of his royal office, that he is our king, that he's ruling and reigning over us. Watch for that as you're seeing art programs or flipping through books, Jesus holding the pomegranate. Well, it just wasn't a uh, fruit for the kings. If you go to the Israeli Museum over in the Near East, you can see an exhibit about a very special item that came to attention, I think it was back in the 1980s. The museum purchased this, I think it was like $500,000. They paid for this artifact that was discovered. And it's it's small, it's maybe about the size of your thumb. <coughs> and it's that shape of a pomegranate as it's growing. And at the top, it's got that crown type shape on it. And at the base of that little shape of the pomegranate, there's a space for a rod to be put into the bottom of it. And they believe that this was a staff with a little crown on it. And there's writing along the top of it, and it says, Holy to the priests of the house of Yahweh. In other words, it's talking about the priests serving at the temple. That this was like a scepter borne by the priests, maybe even by the high priest, as he was serving there. They date it to about the 8th century B.C. So we see that that pomegranate was an important symbol, not just of the royalty of the royal house in Israel, but also of that priesthood that would lead God's people in the worship. And in earlier readings we've had in this series, we've read about the decorations in the <coughs> temple and the different, different uh, features that appeared on the walls and the doors and the carvings and the pomegranate was among those things carved, that symbol of holiness and royalty in the heart of the temple, of the people of God. In the popular mind, the pomegranate represented symbols, or excuse me, fertility, <coughs> fertility, because when you cut it open, there were all these seeds inside it. It looked like it was really wanting to make more trees, okay? And so the, the Greeks especially liked that symbolism in the imagery. But for Israel, it was about that royalty and holiness, gifts and blessings of God in leadership. Now that brings us to the second <coughs> reading that I gave that mentions the pomegranates. And that's the Song of Solomon, fourth chapter. It mentions pomegranates twice. In that reading. And it says Solomon is describing his bride. She's called the Shunammite in another passage there. And she would have uh, grown up in the far northern part of Israel. And Solomon would have grown up in the southern part of Israel. And the wedding for these two would have brought the north and the south. The two divisions of Israel. It would have brought them together. It symbolized the unity of the nation. And that's a part of the poem and the poetry that's going on here. Solomon is looking at her and he says she's got, she's got uh, cheeks or temples like pomegranates. They're round and beautiful behind her veil. He goes on and on about, about her form, her beauty, the balance of it all, what we call symmetry, that everything matches on both sides. Of the body and its appearance. One of the basic <coughs> standards of beauty in our culture, too. She is a wonder of God's creation. 
And then comes the next reference, which appears in uh, verse 13. I'll read that again. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphor with spike, spike nard, and on and on he goes about all these exotic plants. At the heart of her garden is this <coughs> orchard of the pomegranate, showing the uniqueness and specialness of it. It's sealed so no one else can go in. It's only there for her husband, for the king, to enter in. Everything that surrounds the orchard is precious and beautiful. And she is a mystery to be experienced by her husband. In 2001, a recent singer, John Mayer, came out with a song talking about the woman that he loved as a wonderland. And Solomon beat him to it by about 3,000 years in this description describing his bride, Shunammite. The song is sensual. And Israel, the, the habit was not for men to read it until they were 30 years old. <laughs> you couldn't hear this. But it is more than that. It's about that king as the husband marrying the land and the people of the land as their leader. It's about that unity, a sacred union. <clears throat> leading the house and the people that were there. At the temple, uh, we see Solomon acting like a priest. He prays for the land. He prays for the people at the dedication of the temple. And as a king, he's known as the king of peace. His name, Solomon, means peace. And all of this symbolism, this rich symbolism of the Old Testament, points forward to our king, our king of peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> He is our King of Peace. He is reigning over us as our High Priest. He is interceding for us, praying on our behalf. And boy, is, is this...